understand the science behind it. Uh, but uh, rare earth and the current situation, you cannot run away from Linus. You'll get it out, you know, it's the timing. Um, I just want to make one point. I totally respect China, uh, Dr. Yan, because you produce, you extract the rare earth in your country, you produce and you process it in your country, and you take whatever risk there is to it. Okay. Our suggestion would be for Linus, it's a totally economic issue. We have not seen the cost-benefit analysis besides creation of some jobs in Gebeng, but there are other ways to create jobs. Our issue is, Linus, please, if you were to extract it in Australia, process it in Australia, produce it in Australia, and sell it from Australia. Thank you. Yes, uh, as I said earlier, I think uh, you, know, you would have to talk to Nick Curtis and some of the people there to get the, the basic numbers. I'm, I'm not privy to that, uh, but my feeling is they, they reviewed a number of sites. Uh, they, the first one was in Shandong province in China. The economics, uh, because of the Chinese tax system, precluded them from going forward with that site. Um, I think they, they looked around uh, a number of different locations. I don't think just focused in on uh, Kwantan. Uh, but there were a number of benefits for Kwantan, seaport, uh, infrastructure, uh, access to chemicals, access to uh, educated labor. So I think you know it, they would be balanced out over a number of different points. I don't think, you know, uh, there would be anything else beyond just a, a pure business reason. Why they don't do it in Australia? As I said, Mount Weld is a very remote location to bring, the, you either have to bring the chemicals in uh, and, and that's, uh, and the, the labor is very expensive there because you're in a very remote location. Uh, Alexa, I would like you to basically also comment that uh, in, in, in this globalized world, whether uh, you know some some uh, natural resource of one country that everything must then be processed and all that done in that country and then you know, only the end product is exported. Um, no, I think if you take a look, uh, as I say, Canada is a great example. We've got a tremendous history of shipping our natural resources around the world and buying them back at exorbitant uh, process prices uh, in finished goods. Uh, if you look at most of the rare earth uh, projects that are being developed around the world right now, uh, there's Avalon up in Northwest Territories of Canada. They have just announced that they're looking at putting a processing facility in Louisiana, which distance-wise is likely not that much different than Australia uh, to Malaysia, but uh, as Jack will tell you, shipping that material across 10 or 12 state boundaries in the U.S. will uh, create a very large, um, complicated paperwork issue. Um, I think, uh, I'm trying to think of the other ones. I know um, Nora Schar in Sweden is looking uh, likely outside of Sweden to process their materials. Um, you know, the only place that I know that is actively process or looking at processing at their site is uh, Great West Minerals in uh, South Africa. Uh, part of the reason for that is uh, it's a previously operational site that has a license for storage of thorium, so that they're reactivating that site under the government license. Uh, but there are. Um, I think there's another deposit that's been uh, looked at uh, in Madagascar. Uh, they're looking at shipping or have announced a, uh, an agreement with uh, Rodia, the French company. They would ship the material from Madagascar to La Rochelle in France for processing. So there is a, a history within the industry actually and even within China uh, if you take a look at uh, South China clays, most of that is dug up in Jiangxi province and up until a few years ago, most of the processing of that material was done in Jiangsu province. Again, for logistic reasons and access to chemicals and processing. Uh, Bayanobo, 
there's a number of plants outside of the Balto area that actually process the material as well. And again, it comes down to location, access to uh, chemicals. Uh, Zibo uh, in Shandong province has a, a couple of factories right beside the second largest petrochemical uh, facility in China. So there's more than just, uh, you know, building it by the mine site. Uh, there's a number of instances of that in the past. Um, Japan uh, used to process semi uh, rare mat or raw material from China until uh, it just became uneconomical for them to try and process in Japan versus the Chinese themselves. Uh, I, I would like to also ask uh, uh, Professor Yen this. You know, as China is buying out a lot of uh, you know natural uh, resources from Africa and other country, uh, is there a possibility that you you buy up a, a rare earth mine somewhere else and bring the ore back to China for processing? Mr. One one comment, Mr. Chairman. Um, I totally understand the business side of it. If I was Linus, I would pick Malaysia. I totally understand. Uh, I'm an economist by training, and I understand the rationale of, of Linus. I don't blame Linus at all. But as a Malaysian, I do not see the, the economic benefit and the environmental risk that's in, which is, is, worth, is, is worth it. So that's it. Can, can you can you first? Yeah. <clears throat> Just, uh, just mentioned by uh, Dr. Uh, Alistair there. And uh, even the, the Inner Mongolia, bang uh, ores, they are not only produced or treated in local, in, in, in Balto. And um, most of them are treated out of Balto. So that's a transportation from the Bering Obo to the south, uh, south part of China, even to the Canton, right? So the transportation is not the, uh, not the, uh, the, the, the reason. Uh, for the, uh, the reason is, you concern is the, the ores contain some trace amount of the radioactive elements. So that's a, during the past 30 years, the Chinese also export the monazite from the abroad. And in recent years, we stopped. Not only, uh, not because, uh, mainly because uh, due to the radioactive elements, but also the local and uh, domestic production of the ores or mining pro uh, products is ultra exceeded the requirements. Um, just to go further on, on your point, um, I think you have to look beyond just the lamp facility itself and what is the potential benefit to Malaysia. Touched a little about uh, this morning my presentation and one is, you know, the Japanese want to gain access to non-Chinese sourced material wherever it is around the world and they would like to put in processing facilities close to that so that you can do more value added benefits in places like Malaysia. You also have the opportunity as I said earlier about developing research uh, into the applications uh, because the rarest needs to look at our industry in general has to look at more applications for rares, uh, particularly cerium and lanthanum. Uh, but in addition to that, I think you can also develop a skill set within Malaysia that, uh, you know, China is the center of the universe when it comes to understanding rares. You have an opportunity now to go and become sort of the second center of the universe in research and development process knowledge, engineering technology, and I think that's beyond just Linus. I think there's a bigger picture here that can be built on, but you need, you know, you need government support, you need industrial support, and, and you need a, a longer-term vision uh, in that regard. Please. 
Thank you, Dr. Uh, Moderator. Uh, before you start, we still have 20 to 25 minutes left, so please you know, do come yeah. forward with more questions okay. or comments. Uh, my name is Omar again yeah. from Mango. Um, I think earlier on we heard a comment from Jeff Lifton and also Alistair Neal that we are lucky here in Malaysia for, with the Linus plan that we have the benefit of, of learning from the mistakes done in the past. And uh, I think Jeff Lifton alluded us to the uh, three mile long island nuclear, or nuclear accident, not as a disaster, where he said that nobody died. Um, probably it's also worth noting that two days ago, Japan shut down their last nuclear plant. And there's no likelihood of that going to be recommissioned. And uh, this is a consequence of the uh, incident in Fukushima uh, last year. So, and, and also I think we have a presenter from Germany. Germany has already made it a public uh, knowledge that they're going to stop using nuclear in the year 2020. And, uh, and many other countries. So uh, I'm not going to argue about nuclear here, but there is a relationship here because we are talking about radioactivity. And, uh, and the uh, uh, Mac Alistair even uh, brought us back to the Industrial Revolution uh, in trying to impress upon us that you know the Linus plan is probably the base that uh, we've got after learning from the mistakes done in the past. My comment here is, if we have learned from the mistakes of the past, we don't have to go far. We have got the Asian Ray Earth incident, accident that is still giving negative uh, effect to the people around there or even probably in the future. If we have learned from that, we will not be having this forum here today. Now, we would have it two or three years ago before the first brick was laid in Gebeng. We should have done it before even we started it. That is the right way to do. But we are talking about the issue after the thing was even given a temporary go ahead to start production. And we are basically putting the cart before the horse here. So, have we learned anything from what happened in the past? So, what, what, what is your question or what? No, my comment is, we have heard comment from the expert. No, I know. that International that expert that we have now, learned from the past. Oh, so, now, but, what, what, what is your, 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 com your comment or from now? Okay. A uh, gentleman just now, he gave his name but he didn't say where he's coming but I can assume he's, he's either an employee of Linus or consultant with Linus or connected with the project. He was saying that the, the thorium is six, uh, six uh, becquerel per gram which is even, uh, I think the same in Kerala, he said, he was comparing it to the same in Kerala as being uh, probably the beach the beach the beach ah, the beach, the beach yeah. in kerala the beach in kerala uh, i don't know why he didn't compare it to the beach in in kuantan or batu feringi but if that is so that chairman why did why did the international atomic energy agency come up with the 11 point recommendation or stipulation as stated in this book on page 58 and 57, uh, 59. They could have come here and said, listen, there was no issue, pack the bag and go back. Why did they come up with this? If, if what the gentleman said is of no concern to anybody, it's the way that he is put it to, to us. So, that my view is they've come up with 11 points which the Academy of Science has fully endorsed and supported. Thank you. Uh, I, I think on, on, on that, uh, you know, the Atomic, uh, International Atomic Agency, you know, the expert group, the recommendation, which I, I think, if I understand, government and liners also accepted. I, I think the thing is not just that we invite an international 
uh, what call commission or uh, uh, com committee or expert to come and just look at the plan and then just endorse because they did come and you know and have a uh, conduct town hall meetings and all so it's the same with uh, you know with what we are trying to do today it's just that let us basically you know sort of uh, as all concerned Malaysians just you know express what our views and all this and then if there are international experts that can uh, you know provide us with their experiences from their own country then you know maybe we are all you know a, a bit uh, wiser about about the, the issue I think this is basically why we are having this meeting but I I, I, I want to to say that uh, Bukit Merah in the 80s. Now we are, what you call it, uh, uh, the first decade of the 21st century. So that's why I think okay. we must not always go back to 40 years, 50 years ago because there has been a bad experience. Then we stop everything. But we must actually learn by actually going to the facts. I mean, this is a scientific approach that we go to the facts and then we look at it and after that and we say okay every every venture every uh, what enterprise uh, has its risk so the the the, 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 the what you call the basic premise is just that you must ensure public safety just like Dr. McCall said we must ensure public safety and if we are not convinced that there are measures to to ensure public safety then i think we like academy sciences malaysia we have a duty to tell government that you know unless you do something more then this plan is not safe but if the fact says that you know after comparing with what china's experience germany's experience canada's experience that actually this is built according to known standards then I mean we, we have also got to say so but as I, I said before we must also ensure that the enforcement of uh, standards and regulation must be for the whole life of the plant not just when you know because public concern is uh, very very you know uh, hot at the present moment then we you know we put attention more attention to this so so I, I I think that the other thing is that we cannot run away that this forum must have the Linus shadow over it so but the, uh, except for Alistair the other three they only first visit to Malaysia yesterday so tomorrow we are taking them to Linus to have a look at liners so I'm, I'm trying to, uh, to I think you all know that on Wednesday morning we are having the uh, Academy Science uh, learned discourse so that one may we will tell a bit more in technical detail about the safety health and all that expect but I also would, would feel that they would comment because after they have visited liners they would comment a bit more about their their impression or whatever of the of the Linus plant and the discussion with them. so I would welcome everyone to go to the to come and again uh, what you call to interact with our international expert on Wednesday morning I think you all have got a copy of the brochure uh, this this will be at the uh, Institute of Diplomacy and Foreign Relations that is Jalan Wisma Putra, Kuala Lumpur, on Wednesday, and it starts at nine o'clock. And so, you know, we would like you to come again, and then maybe, you know, the, our international guests would have a bit more to tell. Because now you ask them about liners, uh, they have not been, and neither have I. So, you know, it is uh, maybe they would have more to tell us. Uh, on, on Wednesday so I, I would like uh, to urge you if possible you know to continue with the with the discussion and the, and the debate please oh, sorry I, I forgot about you yeah no is it um, 
Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Adrian Yeo. Um, I'm so glad that this morning's paper's presentation, touched by most of the speakers, um, valued that the processes is no longer the mining issue. It's very much on the processes that must be improved and must be transparent. Um, I also apologize uh, to the speakers if our Malaysian hospitality is a bit hot this morning, this afternoon. It is not so. It's because that uh, most of us, uh, Malaysian public, are not being told the right facts and uh, uh, be transparent of, of the plant itself. Um, I, I, I can share a recent uh, experience is that the local NGO group have to copy by pencil on a piece of paper, line by line, paragraph by paragraph, graph by graph, because the authority did not uh, allow uh, a copy to be given out to the public. I think this was the RIA. Uh, by, by the uh, local authority. Um, this is the extent of the authorities preventing sharing of information to the public. Um, I hope that uh, the international experts uh, like yourself could take note on that and also advise us uh, if, if, if possible. I'm also glad that the organizers will bring um, you all to the plant itself because uh, the local people, the stakeholders of Kuantan, have not even uh, been brought into the plant after various uh, requests. Um, my question would be, um, from your uh, experiences worldwide and also managing, uh, I, I understand some of you managing some, some of the uh, array of plants as well, what do you do with the residues, uh, especially the radioactive residues uh, after the processing, um, both the gases, the water leachate, and also the, uh, the solid waste, what do you do with the radioactive uh, residue? Thank you. Professor Yanti. <coughs> Yeah, this is a good question, and um, uh, I just mentioned we should to, uh, to 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 move our control line from the uh, from the post to the pre-control of the residues. From the point of view of economics, and if the residue contained the radioactive elements, the cost to treat it is more higher than the pre-treatment. So if the process want to improve or the process is satisfied not only to the, to the cost but also to the public, I think that they should to, uh, to make the control line as the pre-control to separate or remove the, the radioactive elements from the residue. And after the residues contain the, uh, such kind of the elements, it's um, no values to, re, uh, to be reused. Uh, I'm Badrul from UC Malaysia Pahang. I just want to make several comments and also maybe maybe just throw the, the things. One, I think the comment from that, uh, why they should do, I mean, one of the from Shah Rizal uh, you produce it in Australia and, and, and put the, the plant in Australia. I think many plants, I worked before in many plants before in Malaysia, we import almost all of our, our raw material from outside. Petronas in Tanga Batu, they exported their sweet, sweet and uh, sour crude uh, from overseas. And the plant in production, for example, producing the carbon black, they imported 100% of their heavy oil from the US. And they have to the waste after they use it. So it is not, for me, it's uncommon that a company come here and invest and, 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 and process the, the, the raw material. I think there's so many examples. You went to the plant in Kluan, for example, the synthetic latex. It's the same issues. They also bring the styrene and butyrene from, the, from outside from all over the world. Okay, I think one thing that I'd like also to, 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 to answer, about, not to answer, but to, to make the comment on the IEA. I think many of us didn't read the IEA in detail. I think IEA stated in that report that LINAS, I think, is not unique uh, to a Earth's plant. It's not a unique plant, one. Second, that in that report also, so that it's, a, it's already compliant to all the regulation. It's also complement about the EALB and the LINAS. And the 11 recommendation that you see from that, if you read the IA properly, it is a recommendation to, for improvement. So, so that's, I think we need to, to make sure that. And then uh, one thing that I was involved in Bukit Merah before, because one of the, my concerns is at that time is about the waste. 
because I was working with nuclear Malaysia because we want to treat the waste because it's so high in the radioactive. But here, if you compare, that's why the, I think that they have not been presented today. If you read the page 30 in the in the in the in the report by ASM, it's clearly stated that the residue is 360,000 ppm of thorium in ARE and 1,650 ppm for Linus. That's why I think what Professor Zian was saying just now, is it worthy or not to extract out that thorium from that waste when the amount is very low, 0.165% compared to about 3 or 4% of the issue in the Asian Red Earth. And I think one thing that we Malaysians have to, to, to understand about the scientific fact is that this is not a nuclear power plant. I think that is the basis, the premise that we have to, to, to put the basis this is a nuclear, because what I hear recently is Fukushima, Chernobyl, and others. And I live in Kuantan. Okay, I live in Kuantan. I have my grandchildren in Kuantan. I have my son in Kuantan. And I'm also concerned as all of you. But let's face it with the fact, scientific fact, whether it is a nuclear power plant or it's just a plant, a chemical plant producing the nuclear, this is the rare earth metals. And look at, and looks at the level of the thorium inside. And I'm a chemical engineer. When I taught my, my, my students about plant design, we thought about all this. The investors, why they choose Malaysia, why they choose the countries that need to invest in. So this is something that we need to, to put in together and understand the benefit rather than just saying that, oh, because it's only Linus to give 350 people, and then you say that, no, go back to, to Australia. Remember, where are the engineers of Malaysia now all and gas? I will ask you, all of you know that the engineers from Malaysia is all now all over the world. Why? Because of the experience they got in the oil and gas industries that brought to Malaysia and they become the expert. Imagine if these 33 companies, 33 projects of rare earths that will be established soon, maybe the engineers will come from Malaysia. Because China, they can do it because all the experts in China right now. And many countries cannot do the rare earths because they don't have the experts. And when I was in Beijing a few months back, I was very impressed because the Chinese got all, almost all the experts in the rare earths. And that's why they are capable in doing it in addition to the raw material, but also on the experts. Thank you. Thank you. Can I make a comment to the last uh, speaker? Number one, when Petronas import in, it, it was a national benefit. Linus is doing it. Yes, I can understand the process where we will be able to build local capacity, local expertise in the long term. I understand that totally. But I think you have heard today, the issue is the public confidence in terms of governance of setting up the plan. That is very open and transparent. Because we do not see transparency, we see uh, we see uh, things move fast. We do not see cost-benefit analysis. We see 12-year break for Linus, and we do not we are not able to weigh what is the benefit to the Malaysian, where else the un so-called unfounded fears overweigh us. We have no access to the plan. We have no uh, transparency dialogue with the people. We have to copy down even the reports. So you don't make it transparent, people will have their fears. And this is why I think uh, symposium seminars like this is good. But the question is, Petronas benefited because it was open, it was transparent, and it was a national agency that got the benefit. In, in Linus' case, it's way far beyond that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can I have the last? Yes. The last say. Okay. Thank you, Dato. I'm actually uh, referring to your question earlier. Uh. Why ch uh, would China be buying a ray earth mine? You did ask that earlier. Uh. And I think, I don't know whether you did get the answer or not. Uh, the answer is, they did try to buy liners through a government, China government-owned company by offering, by trying to buy 51.5% share in liners, but that was shot down by the Australian 
security uh, authorities. Uh, for what reason, I don't know, maybe security itself. But that was, they did try to buy it, and it was shot down. And because of that, that was why Linus did not want to send it to China for processing. Uh, and and, and they, they were choosing between yeah. somewhere in Western Australia and Kuantan. And uh, of course, the Japanese don't want it done in their backyard. They want it done in someone else's backyard. And don't forget, it was a Japanese company that was involved in the, in the Tanamera, in the Bukit Merah issue, ARE. So, uh, okay. and again, you know, I think it always boils down. We, we don't need to be a nuclear expert or a rocket scientist, actually. It's just, it just to me, as a lay person, it defies logic. And it, it doesn't fit into common sense. Why would Linus, having all the ore in Australia there, I admit that maybe Mount, uh, Mount Well is not a suitable area. It's right in the desert area. But there is a place somewhere near Australia, in the Western Australia, that you can get the water, you got, you got port facilities to do it there. Why would they ship it 5,000 kilometers? all the way to Kuantan to do it. It just doesn't feel logic to me. Unless you're trying to say that Nicholas Curtis has fallen in love with Malaysia and is trying to make us a modern uh, economy or new e income economy. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, I may have the timing wrong on this, but I believe the decision to go to Kuantan was made before the Australian government rejected the approach from the uh, non-ferrous non metals in China. So the decision was already made prior to that. China has gone into Chile, to my knowledge, and bought a, um, uh, a deposit there. They're involved in Madagascar right now. Uh, China is going around the world. Iron ore, uh, copper, uh, aluminum, you name it. You know, they need resource access to resources because they aren't self-sufficient internally. So this is something that they're doing on a very broad scale. Yeah. And certain places, uh, Canada for one, you know, we're very conscious of uh, people coming in and buying up our companies. You know, we had the largest nickel companies in the world, Inco and Falconbridge at one time, and those were taken over with a lot of internal discussion in Canada about those acquisitions. Uh, yeah. But I think in answer to your question, the decision to move from China to Kuantan was made because the Chinese, with their tax system, made it totally unattractive to go there. All of a sudden, having a facility outside of China became 42% more cost effective because you didn't have to pay the export taxes. That's why, the, to my knowledge, the facility didn't go into yep. China. China, yep. in the long run, will import rare earths from somewhere because they will not be able to sustain their demand from internal sources. At least yep. that's my belief. Yep. It's, it would be more cost effective uh, to me, do it in the backyard as well. There's another yeah. speaker uh, waiting to, to, be, to speak. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Yun Xiaolong. Uh, just two comments. The members of the panel, if you do manage indeed to visit the Linus plant and get internal access, you will have a privilege that very few people have enjoyed to date because there was a press junket within the last month or so to visit the plant and the press were not allowed into the actual plant to survey the material there. They were taken in for a discussion with the local head of Linus here, but he cut off the question and answer session quite abruptly after 30 minutes. And they were forced to observe the plant from the confines of the bus. So if you do manage to get in, then you will enjoy a lot more uh, access and transparency than Malaysians have had so far. Now, the second point is, Going back to the issue of economics, I think you make a good point, Mr. Lifton. Uh, but at the same time, as many people have raised, there needs to be transparency here about what will the net economic benefit for Malaysia be. In a sense, we are helping an Australian company shift its operations to our own country and evade some of the responsibilities which they would otherwise be incurred in Australia. From what I understand from speaking to Australian legislators, it's normal practice in Australia, if you extract minerals from a mine and you process them, you are duty bound to return them to the side of the mine for permanent waste disposal. 
one of the big question marks that we have in Malaysia now with the Linus case is what is going to happen with permanent waste disposal. AELB has given Linus quite a lot of time to consider that issue. They still have not been able to provide an answer. And that is worrying. Because if, as other people say, the Linus plant is nothing special, nothing new in the world, then why is it taking so long to come up with a permanent waste disposal proposal? So that's a very big question mark that weighs on our minds. And speaking towards the theme of your conference today and your report in terms of rare earth industries, that's another hypothetical as well. Because Malaysia's R&D capacity, to be frank, is not very strong. In terms of developing and moving green economy technologies forward under Malaysian ownership and Malaysian benefit and profit, we're not going to, it's going to be very difficult to engineer that. Why? One, we don't own strategic patents on those kind of, project, on those kind of products. Developing those will be very difficult, given our existing scientific capacity. If you want them, we'll have to buy them, just like we've done with Lamborghini and so forth, with other car makers and other technologies. That's very expensive. That's a very expensive route to development. What's likely going to happen if, if there is a local market for rare earth production, rare earth material development, we'll have more foreign companies coming in, and we'll have to have the very diff difficult economic calculus, just like we have with Linus, in determining what is the net benefit for Malaysia. If you give pioneer tax breaks, 12-year pioneer tax breaks to every single company that comes in, that works in this area, what does Malaysia get at the end of the day? The price for us may be good, but what will we reap? Excise and tax duties, customs duties. And that's very minimal. It's a very minimal okay. income or benefit uh, okay. to us compared to the rest. Thank so. you. Uh, can I just uh, add this about you know R and D capacities and all? So uh, our report actually uh, recommend that uh, universities here must build up the R and D capacity, not only for real earth, for all mineral. Because uh, since the uh, shutdown of our tin industry. You know, we don't even have a, a mining engineering de department uh, in any universities. I remember, you know, in the old days, uh, we used to, ex you know, to export uh, experts, Malaysian, not expatriate, Malaysian tin mining experts to the Congo, to Brazil, to help them open up tin mines, you see. So I, 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 I think that one of the, the recommendations is that that like Professor Yen from Beijing University is here. So we would like to, you know, to consult him about how to develop a curriculum, uh, not only about real earth, R&D, but at the normal engineering course for mining as well. See? But we have even recommended that uh, the industry must be actually supported by SMEs. And for SMEs, you really need the vocational expertise. And we have even recommended that like China, you should actually go down even at the vocational training level. Now, if you say that uh, because we have no R&D expertise now, then things will not happen. But I must remind you that uh, like car industry, we have a quite a flourishing car accessory industry. Like we talk about the catalytic converter, now, uh, like I, I was with UMW Holdings, you know, as an independent non-exec director for nearly a decade. We actually manufacture the exhaust system, but the catalytic converter has to be completely important. So I'm talking about if we have the real earth, and then the, the what called the motor assembly plant is now extended to do local R and D and procurement. It's not a completely new industry. Like, like the rare earth is used in, uh, in uh, oil and gas. So oil and gas industry also, we are saying that if the rare earth element is available, then the, the factory, the multinational like the BASF, who manufacture the uh, MTPE, which is the octane booster for, for petrol, for lead, uh, lead free petrol, then you know they would have the R&D here rather than at their home office in Germany and then you know it will spawn more uh, downstream development of uh, related industry. 
Now, uh, before I, I close, can I just say uh, what we are going to do uh, from this seminar? Because time is short and our visitors are with us only a very short time. So the uh, Academy of Science Malaysia uh, is already put the uh, real earth ex uh, the, the, the report on our website. I would like to recommend to Academy of Science uh, to highlight it on the home page, real earth. Then uh, we are going to make all the presentations today available. Also, uh, what you call Wednesday's uh, presentation available for download. And, and the Utah, Utah is very kind having four reporters here. And we would particularly like this panel discussion to be actually, you know, make available as soon as possible. And then uh, be available from the website, ASM website. But parti more particularly is that, that if you, uh, we want to open a web consultation, a continuing consultation process. So if you have got any uh, questions to post to our, our international uh, speakers here, they have undertaken to reply to you. So we hope that this continuing dialogue is a way forward for Malaysia, that we want to have consultation. I think uh, going forward, like uh, any new plant, uh, high-tech, green technology, every new plant will have risk because material use would be state-of-the-art, may not be proven. But the most important thing, like uh, if you can learn from even China and other countries, is that nowadays community consultation first, and then also scientific and academic, uh, what called consultation with the scientific and academic uh, community, academic community from the concept, conception stage of the project, and then the whole life cycle right up to decommissioning, it should be actually discussed. Uh, and this one, we would like to emulate the Royal Society. The Royal Society has studies on GMO, which is of great concern to Europe, and also on nanotechnology, because it is going down to the gene level. You know, And they have been having consultation on their website for seven years, and passed on all the concerns of the public continually to the British government. And this is what we would like our academy to emulate our sister academy in the developed world and then set the pattern for public consultation going forward. Okay. Now, uh, before I, I, I close, I would like just to point out that uh, I have downloaded three DVDs from the Phoenix channel on the real earth. But these are in Mandarin, and uh, unfortunately, the subtitle is also in Chinese. One, the first one is uh, actually April last year, when after Fukushima, this thing became very hot, and it was actually a, a, a lecture by the academic director of the Chinese Real Earth Society, uh, Dr. Uh, 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 what, uh, Dr. Chen. Dr. Chen. And then uh, when the, uh, China was taken to the WTO, they lost the case, but not on real earth material, but on related strategic material. And, but we know that it was shadow boxing. The target was Chinese real earth ex restriction of ex uh, export. There was another video. So the first video was, was called uh, China and the real earth war. The second video in July last year was uh, the real earth war again. The third one was just last month because after Japan, the US and Europe brought the real earth to the complaint about restriction of real earth uh, export to, uh, to the WTO, even President Clinton was making some remarks uh, against China. So the third uh, DVD was aired last month and in that DVD you can see what Bao Tao has gone through the, the what called the dump the dump into a lakeside very bad uh, and then after that now what they are trying to uh,
to do to improve the situation. But more importantly, there were two pictures of Linus. The demonstration against Linus. So if anyone who uh, understand Mandarin, who would like to have copy of this, just you know, tell our secretariat and they will make copies and send it to you. Actually, it is a very good reference material for you to understand the world of the real earth, how strategic the material it is. Okay. Uh, so uh, with this, I would like to thank all our panelists uh, for 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 this uh, panel discussion, and also to thank all of you for being, you know, so proactive in making this uh, discussion actually very very fruitful. Thank you very much for chairing the panel discussion. Ladies and gentlemen, we now invite Yang Berusaha, Dr. Ahmad Ibrahim, CEO and Fellow of the Academy of Sciences Malaysia, to deliver his closing remarks and close the symposium. Dipersilakan, Doctor. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum and good evening. I've been following the discussion, so there is still a lot of confusion. But what is clear is that there are opportunities in rare earth. What is also clear, there are risks. Actually, at the round table, we were supposed to discuss should Malaysia invest in rare earth? But there was overwhelming discussion on Linus. Linus is only one part of the rare earth industry. I think it is unwise if Malaysia is to actually capture the benefits of the rare earth to only focus on processing and separation. No. We should look at the whole value chain, the whole value chain up to the downstream. We should actually invite foreign investment to partner us in the value chain. But why should foreign investment come here? Normally, investors come First, if there is a supply of the raw material. Second, if there is a market. Malaysia, no market. And unless we have the supply of raw materials that Linus is producing, no investor in the downstream will come here. So I think we have to decide as a country, is it in our interest to invest in rare earth? Now, why Academy Science is involved in this? You see, academic science, we are scientific think tank. We produce advice for the government related to how science can help sustain the country's development or explore new opportunities that the country can tap in the emerging global market. We undertake under the mega science program, we look at the various sectors of the country and look at the future. So while we're doing the work on energy, we stumble on this opportunity that is presented by Rare Earth. We have already listened to the presentation by international speakers that there is truly a big demand emerging because of this miniaturization of products. Products are becoming smaller, lighter, low carbon, all this actually contribute to the demand for rare earth. Now, Malaysia will have to decide. We talk a lot about high income, high tech. Of course, every industry carries risk. We don't argue with that. There are risks in the rare earth industry, but are these risks manageable? This is a question that we have asked the international experts. And apparently, there are technologies, there are mechanisms to manage those risks. So I think it's for Malaysia to decide. We as a scientist, as an academy, we only provide the facts. We provide the facts on science, on safety, on the risk, on the opportunities, on the technology. And if we are really to go big into rare earth, we have to invest in the human capital. We have to attract the joint ventures with foreign investment, we have access to markets. I remember I used to work for palm oil when we developed the oleochemical industry. Why did big names in oleochemical came here? 
because we have palm oil. We don't have the market, but they have the market, they have the technology. And look at what oleo chemical has contributed to the country now. It is a big earner of revenue for the country. So can we do the same thing with rare earths? Of course there are risks, but we need to manage this risk. I think uh, if Malaysia is serious about moving into this high-tech industry, this is only the first test case of a high-risk business. There are more coming our way. And the point made is that increasingly, all business, all industries must have the social license, I call it. That's why engagement with society, engagement with community is critical. We have to be transparent. I think there is no argument on that. We have to be transparent. We have to tell society what are the facts. We need to do baseline studies to better understand. Instead of coming out, I believe, I think, we scientists, we don't argue on those fronts. We science, scientists argue on facts, on evidence. If we don't have the evidence, we just shut up. But I see here there are some people who come, I believe this is, I think, I heard. These are not the way scientists argue. So I think if the country is really to move forward and to tap on science as an instrument of development, we have to be very objective, we have to be rational, we have to be based on evidence. But most of all, we have to get our societies informed but what are the, the, the real facts? And I was recently in London, I met the Royal Society. They are now talking about preparing their people for this new technology on synthetic biology. This is coming and this has risk. This has also opportunities. So you cannot get capture opportunities without managing the risk. There is no such business. All business carry risk. All technology carries risk. So I think for the way forward, Academy Science of Malaysia, we will always be engaging the public on this area of high risk business. And rare earth is one of those business. And at the end of the day, I think the society will have to decide, the community will have to decide whether we want to embrace this new area of business. If we want, then we have to prepare ourselves. We have to take the necessary measures. We have to have proper enforcement. I know there are some uh, uh, low confidence in some of the enforcement agencies in the country. So this is a wake-up call. If we are to venture in this kind of high-risk business, the enforcement agencies must also get themselves ready. They must be properly trained, and they must be very stringent in the enforcement of their regulation. So, but finally, I think it has been a very fruitful discussion. We have got views. We have listened to various comments. This is what the, the round table is all about. The academy just want to present the facts, and we want to listen. What is the perception? What are the worries? So that we can continue to address this in our future engagement. So with this word, I would like to thank everyone, and to, thank you once again for coming. Thank you. So. and contributions made during the symposium. For your information, all the presentations made here will be uploaded into our ASM website by this weekend. Thank you once again. You are welcome for tea in the next room.